But the genocide does not end with Trump election. True. Uh, the genocide will most likely be worse. Uh, and our ability to advocate as he thinks anybody who is against him is an enemy within diminishes. Uh, and so I would like to still have a fighting chance mm -hmm. uh, in advocating for the end of this genocide without ending up behind bars. That was Ilhan Omar's message to leftists who are disillusioned with Kamala Harris because of her refusal to call for an arms embargo on Israel. And to be frank, her position is utterly indefensible, and the left is rightly more focused on her and the Biden administration since they're currently in power, and they right now have the ability to affect change. So as it stands right now, the prospect of Trump being worse, even though we all know it's true, feels more abstract and less persuasive since things are already so bad that it's inconceivable that it could get any worse. But as the polls tighten and the odds of Trump winning actually go up, we all now have to grapple with the reality of what Ilhan Omar is saying here, and I think she's right. Not only would Trump be worse on Gaza, but our ability to fight him would be diminished in light of his enemy within comments where he threatened to use the military against radical leftists like the protesters. Now, those comments were made after he celebrated the violent police sweep of campus protesters at Columbia University and called for the radicals to be, quote, vanquished. And when you take into account the response to campus protesters overall, as well as unconstitutional BDS laws in dozens of states, it's hard to imagine things getting worse on that front when it comes to free speech specifically. But he is very clearly broadcasting his intent to be worse. And just to give you a little bit of a taste of what we can expect, here's what he said about Netanyahu as it relates to this issue. I want to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu about it. He's uh, called me, yes. Actually, he's called me. I have not spoken. I'm going to speak to him probably now. What are you going to tell him? Well, look, he's doing a good job. Biden is trying to hold him back. Just so you understand, Biden is far superior to the, to the VP. Uh, he's trying to hold him back and they probably should be doing the opposite, actually. I'm glad that BB decided to do what he had to do, but it's, uh, it's moving along pretty good. Everything's moving along. Yes, you have a That's his thoughts about a literal genocide. He actually said it's moving along pretty good and said Netanyahu is doing a good job and thinks that Biden is trying to hold him back when he should be doing the opposite, which... I mean, Biden only halted the shipment of 2,000 pound bombs and only recently, after a year, threatened to implement an arms embargo within 30 days if Israel doesn't increase humanitarian aid to northern Gaza, which is a threat that nobody, including Netanyahu, actually expects him to follow through on. But yet Trump is saying, oh, he should he should not hold Netanyahu back. He has aided and abetted Israel at every step of the way and defied both domestic and international law to cover for Israel. And Trump is saying he's not doing enough to support Israel. And Netanyahu simultaneously seems to agree since he's doing everything that he can to help Donald Trump beat Biden. But the question is, if Biden is already letting Netanyahu do what he wants and Trump, for all intents and purposes, is saying he'd also let Netanyahu do whatever the hell he wants but wouldn't pretend that he's against it, I guess, like Biden, then how can Ilhan Omar make the case that Trump would be materially worse when the only difference presumably would be Trump's rhetoric? I get why people find what Ilhan is saying not persuasive, but just to put it into perspective, a UNDP report found that Israel's bombing of Gaza set the entire strip back seven decades, and it's largely uninhabitable, but the long-term goal for Israel isn't to rebuild Gaza, obviously, it's resettlement. And it's no guarantee that Biden wouldn't go along with that too. But Trump has an actual financial interest in letting Netanyahu grab more Palestinian land. As uncommitted founder Abbas Alloway put it in a recent interview with Portside, quote, Trump's son-in-law is fantasizing about million dollar condos on Gaza's beach. He's taking campaign contributions for people who want full annexation of the West Bank. So we also have to be very clear about the rise of global authoritarianism, of which Trump and the Republican Party's MAGA extremism is a face of. We have to take stock of what it would look like for Trump to be president and whether we're doing the difficult work of this moment, which is not pretty and a lot of folks don't want to hear it, in the sense of telling people and being clear about what our 
our organizing would look like under Donald Trump. The reality is that it would be really, really difficult to see student protesters deported as Trump is promising. And it's not just that. What is our responsibility to the people we love who are there? A few weekends ago, I was on the phone with my uncle who's living in South Lebanon now, and it was the heaviest bombardment he'd experienced since the war in 2006. He was asking me, do people over there know that if Trump becomes president, that he'll give Netanyahu the green light to kill a lot more of us? And that quote from his uncle is, uh, it hit me. Because what do you even say to somebody who's basically begging Americans for his life? He has no power, and we have minimal power as well, aside from choosing who's going to be the person who oversees the genocide for the next four years. And they're saying, are we just going to let Donald Trump come in and kill more of us? It's, it's such a shitty situation, and that is the conundrum that everyone who cares about this issue is currently dealing with. I understand the desire to want to punish Harris and the Democrats for unforgivably supporting a genocide, but we can't electorally punish her without punishing Gazans as well. We can't electorally punish Harris without punishing the people of Lebanon too. So by sticking it to Harris, we are selfishly dooming them to even more death and destruction, even though the current situation might not change if she wins. What a shitty situation. It is a catch-22 because the alternative is Donald fucking Trump. And the counter-argument to that, though, is that you can just vote third party, but that doesn't negate the reality of Duverger's law, right? The fact of reality is that we live in a majoritarian winner-take-all system, and even though it feels good to vote against the duopoly, trust me, I know, because I've done it in the past myself, it's not going to materially change the situation in Gaza because a third-party candidate simply cannot win in our current electoral system. And in swing states, it is especially risky because every vote that doesn't go towards Kamala increases Trump's chances of winning. But I'm not trying to shame third-party voters because if Kamala loses— I don't think it's going to be because of third party voters. It's going to be because Harris refused to do the right thing. And I think that the people who are choosing to stay home because they're so disgusted by this administration's actions is a bigger threat to Democrats than any potential third party spoiler. But at the end of the day, we are splitting hairs here. But I think that the process of splitting hairs and actually hashing this out and trying to forecast what we can expect with the Trump administration is important. Because we're talking about small changes in the grand scheme of things, but changes that will literally be life or death for a lot of people. And we have no right to tell Arab American voters who've lost family in Gaza or Lebanon to suck it up and vote for Harris because Donald Trump would be worse. I don't think that we should be doing that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be objective and have a sober analysis of the situation. As Abbas said, Trump's family is salivating over the prospect of beachfront property in Gaza. And Trump himself took $100 million from Miriam Adelson under the condition that he lets Netanyahu annex the entire West Bank. Now, she's denied that this was her condition because she kind of has to deny that since it'd be a quid pro quo and would thus make her donation illegal. But I mean, after Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem and gave Israel the Golan Heights when it wasn't his to give, we're fooling ourselves to think that he wouldn't comply with Adelson's demand to just let Netanyahu take over the entire West Bank. And if that were to happen, it'd be one of the bloodiest ethnic cleansings in modern history. We know this because we got a glimpse of this in late August when Israel bulldozed 70% of Jenin and destroyed roads, water infrastructure, and made it impossible for emergency services to rescue trapped Palestinians. And we all know that Trump would have no problem letting this happen in every single city and village in the West Bank. And no Nobody in the West would even be paying attention to what he's allowing to happen because they'd be distracted by every other authoritarian thing that Trump chose to do as president if he got a second term. And to be clear, all of this happened under the Biden administration. So there's no guarantee that Harris would prevent Israel from doing this as well. But the difference is that it'd be an inevitability with Donald Trump, whereas with Harris, there's a small chance that she wouldn't let it happen or at least would protest more than Donald Trump would. And even if she did let it happen. Organizers would at least have more leeway to be able to protest and push back on what she's letting happen. Whereas with Trump, he would go above and beyond to punish protesters. As he said, we are the enemy within and you'd use the military to go after the radical leftists who would oppose this annexation of the West Bank. But one thing that gives me some hope, a tiny bit of hope, is the fact that Harris isn't a committed Zionist like Joe Biden 
And I think that she'd probably be a standard Democrat on the issue of Israel, meaning that she'd be terrible, to be clear, but not worse than Republican presidents like Reagan and George H.W. Bush, who actually did use their leverage to reign in Israel, which is something that Biden has refused to do. However, I'll admit that is no guarantee, but even though Harris hasn't been receptive to activists on the campaign trail, Ilhan Omar seems to think that she would be better on this issue than Biden. Uh, I do believe uh, that we could possibly see changes. Um, she does seem to constantly say she wants to follow the law. Uh, and it is my expectation yeah. um, that, that she will. Now, to be honest, I am not as optimistic as she is, but I don't think it's unreasonable for her to think Harris would be better than Biden since the bar is very low and Biden is basically the worst of the worst as far as Democrats are concerned. And also because Harris's team leaked a story to the Washington Post a couple of months ago about her foreign policy advisor, Phil Gordon, thinking that Biden's Israel policy has been a catastrophic failure. And that same anonymous staffer who said that he thought that about Biden's policy also said that they believed that Harris would challenge Netanyahu more directly and would conduct a full review of U.S.-Israel policy to determine what works and what doesn't work. Now, I did a full breakdown of that, which I'll link to down below if you want to watch it, but I don't think it's naive to hold out hope that Harris would be better than Biden since virtually any Democrat would be an improvement upon Biden. But having said that, there's no guarantee. That's just a fact of the matter. There's no guarantee. But when it comes to Harris, there's a possibility even though it's small, there is a possibility that she would be better, whereas when it comes to Donald Trump, there's no possibility that he'd be better whatsoever. Nobody thinks he'd be better. At best, he'd be as bad as Biden, but at worst, he would embolden Netanyahu even more than Biden and suppress the free speech of Americans that protest the destruction that he inevitably enables. But I mean, the mere fact that Netanyahu himself is pushing so hard for Trump, in my mind, is enough to sound the alarms. There's a reason why Netanyahu is doing this. It's because he thinks that he would be completely unrestrained with Donald Trump, even though he still feels pretty emboldened under Biden right now. But he thinks things would be better. He thinks that Trump is the greater of two goods for him. And I think that that's something that we should take into consideration. But still, with that being said, the only two viable candidates as it relates to this issue are just downright terrible. I think that that's inarguable. But at the end of the day, as Ole puts it, we're choosing our adversary in this election. Regardless of who wins, we're going to have to fight that president. And I don't think that we have much of a say thanks to the diminished state of our democracy. But when push comes to shove, I, for one, think that Kamala Harris would be the better opponent to fight against than Donald Trump. We all know it's true. And I think we need to be honest about that and grapple with the reality of that since, well, the polls are close and he could very well win this election. It's time to actually start thinking about the real differences between Trump and Kamala on this issue.